Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Um, back to the Catlia series, and like with the Phalaenopsis series and the Oncidium series, this is a, a care guide. It has to be a relatively rough care guide because there are variables within the Catlia Alliance. So uh, it can actually come down to individual plants. Um, right, I'm going to start with. Um, watering and feeding, as I've just done it for these two. Um, basically, Cattleya roots like air around them. They do well in large bark or anything chunky, um, open baskets, uh, they'll do okay in clay pots, they'll do okay in plastic pots, but they need air around the roots, so they need something that just drains fast and part of that need is the wet dry cycle that they virtually all need across the board <coughs> excuse me <coughs> i've just drowned these two absolutely soak soak them and as it happens it was also a flush which still needs to be done despite the fact this is just in large bark yeah which holds some moisture and the older it gets the more moisture it will hold any media that can hold moisture will hold nutrients yeah and if the plants not using it all it will build up and it will produce basically a toxic environment for your roots you can even get roots dying back if it gets too bad clay pots are guilty as well they hold moisture so they can have a salts build up as well so make sure flushing takes place how often really is up to you. I usually flush about every fourth watering or fifth watering. Um, in the winter time when the growth slows down, you know, lack of light, cooler temperatures, all that, um, I don't feed as often so the flushing takes place more frequently if you see what I mean. So I don't leave them dry too long. The wet dry cycle is necessary. Yeah, keep the roots healthy, keep the plant happy and that depends on how fast your media dries out. The faster the better, but the faster it happens, the more frequently the watering comes round. You see what I mean? So there's a workload, you know, involved there. Um, now this one got repotted at the wrong time with a risk element. It got repotted when I couldn't really see any new roots growing, and I wouldn't normally do that. Um, but I took the risk on the grounds it had these two growths over here had just bloomed and hadn't produced their new roots yet. So knowing Cattleyas, it was highly likely the new roots were about to follow and there they are. Yeah. So although that was a bit of a risk, it was a calculated <laughs> risk. It's all right, I was just looking at something. That looked just like a snail to me. It's not, but <laughs> always on the lookout for those little critters that take your root system down quicker than anything. Now, this new growth up this end of the plant hasn't actually bloomed yet. I don't know whether it will. Plants had a major disturbance. It might be a blind sheath, unknown. But again, new roots just beginning to show up that end of the plant as well. Now, sometimes you repot a cattleya, and um, the old roots don't look too good but if they feel firm I'm inclined to leave them because they can just decide to branch out and then you get new roots from old and on some cattleyas that just doesn't happen <laughs> um, I found that the um, bifoliates uh, the, those that have two leaves at the top of each bulb rather than one um, they're more prone to drop in their older root systems um, it's just, you know, I've got some of each and I've always found that the bifoliates are more reluctant to get going again after a repot, so it's even more critical to get that timing right with those little blighters. Um, anyway, so that one got repotted. Um, it is now growing a new root system. There's even signs of new roots coming out away from the latest two new growths. So it looks like it's going to regenerate a nice new root system. Now this one, that's probably going to drip all over the place, is in this cocoa fibre stuff, and it still is. 
and I'm reluctant to move on this until I see new roots. I know I've got one there, but that's not coming out from the new growth. So it's just a, a random one that's decided to come out. But what I've got, I've, I've got three new growths on here somewhere. Um, one little one there, one under my thumb, and one round that side of the plant. Now both of the new growths here are quite embedded in that cocoa fibre stuff. Um, I will have to take some of that cocoa fibre off under one of the new growths and I'll probably pick on the one that's most developed because that's the one that's liable to start pushing new roots out soon. And as soon as I see new roots I will strip the whole flipping lot off and then we'll get it mounted. This one's going on a mount. Um, down the line a bit but um, I may well get on with um, taking off some of that cocoa fibre. I'm going to pick that new growth there and take that great big lump off and expose the base of that new growth. Then, then I can see are there any new roots? Have I just broken them off? And if I have then obviously I'll have to be a hell of a lot more careful around the others but they've got to come off. That stuff's got to come off at some point so um, we'll get on with that. So, uh, yeah, repotting when new roots are growing. And um, if, it's, if it's in bloom at that time, tough. Just get on with it. <laughs> I've never lost blooms on an orchid yet through repotting. I have lost some buds, though. Um, more on Phalaenopsis than anything else. They seem to be a bit susceptible. If they're in bud, um, you will often find, if you repot at that time with those, those buds will yellow and blast but on most orchids just get on with it it's more important to look after the plant quite honestly and get get it in a nice media a nice setup with a nice set of new roots growing and it'll take off like a little rocket um, if you get that timing wrong it can stall I mean I've had Catlia stall for almost a year by getting that wrong because they they were in the process of their older roots becoming less viable you repot them and disturb them and they start going downhill a lot quicker and there's no new roots to replace them the plant just stalls it's lost its ability to hydrate and feed itself so it just stalls eventually it may well grow a new root system but you've set it back basically so that's watering feeding cattleyas I feed these at med medium to high levels not as high as cattleyas um, but higher than quite a bit of my other stuff. Um, but again, it depends on time of year. There's no point in stoking loads of food into a pot of a plant that isn't growing. At the, you know, it's just sat there doing next to nothing because your days are too short and everything. So that's that. Temperatures, most cattleyas fall into the intermediate range. So not too cold and not too warm. A lot of them will take heat. That doesn't mean they need it but some of them are up that higher end of intermediate heading towards the warm section um, and if you've got one of those it's more likely to be a species rather than the complex hybrids um, then, then that one's not going to like to get cold and then you've got some that prefer to be up the lower end of intermediate. There's quite a few Lalia species come into that category and they don't like to get too warm yeah, so they're up the other end. But you could say that with Cattleya hybrids, somewhere in the middle is pretty good stuff. And don't let them get too cold. And if you, if the, if you, if you have to put up with heat with your plants, then get that humidity up. Yeah, they'll put up with the heat as long as they've got good humidity, because otherwise their leaves will lose moisture faster than they can take it in. The rate is slowed down with good humidity in the air. So that's that. Next we come on to light levels. Now we had our, out of our set of three, Phalaenopsis series, Oncidium series and Cattleya series, these are at the top end of the light requirements. Phalaenopsis down the lower end, Oncidium's in the middle somewhere, and these are up the higher end. So if your Oncidiums are happy with good colour on their leaves and everything like that, you can safely assume that most cattleyas want more light than that. Not huge amounts more, but more. They're up, they're up the higher end. 
they can still burn. I know that sounds daft with these great big thick fleshy leaves. You get them in strong sun suddenly, they can burn in a couple of hours and then you lose your leaves. Um, it, <laughs> at worst case you, you lose your whole leaf and um, <laughs> best case is you just get horrible manky patches all over them and it ruins the look of them basically it takes quite a long time um, if you think how old this plant is here and how many leaves it's got um, if that got badly burnt in the sun and lost most of those leaves it's lost its ability to feed itself it's got no greenery to do the photosynthesis and how long is it going to take to replace those leaves? Yeah, at one or two bulbs a year on a plant that size. If that plant was three times as big, it would probably be growing half a dozen bulbs a year. And it might be able to get some greenery going a bit quicker. So watch your light and watch your light changes. Yeah, by changes I mean, you know, if, if the light's suddenly getting a lot brighter, acclimatise your plant gently. Yeah, don't just take it from in a dark cupboard onto the brightest windowsill you've got in full sun. You will burn it. And some cattleyas are more sensitive than others. I've got one that really is sensitive. It's that um, Iwanagara apple blossom, although that's called something totally different now. Well, not in my grow room, it's not. Um, but that one's quite light sensitive. That will burn quite easily. Um, some of them are as tough as old boots, but I wouldn't try experimenting to find, way, find out which ones by chucking them in full sun. Yeah, Do it gently. And I would still suggest that, you know, summer sun is pushing your luck through that midday period. You know, from late morning through to mid-afternoon. You're pushing your luck. It's up to you. But they don't need it that high. Now you get some cattleyas won't bloom unless they get the higher light but sometimes that higher light is a requirement at a certain phase of its growth that coincides with its brightest light where it comes from and we're back to species again now the hybrids have probably lost most of that genetic makeup right so that's that resting cattleyas there are some in, the, in amongst the species there are some that have a distinct rest period and again it goes down to where they grow the rain virtually disappears they have a period where there's hardly any water around um, so they have a rest and it coincides often with a growth cycle a part of their growth cycle now with some they grow their bulbs push up their bulbs mature their bulbs and may even produce their sheath prior to that rest period and then they stop yeah the rains ease right off there's not much going on and the plants are resting for a period of anything from a couple of weeks to a couple of months it's plant specific yeah you've got to go and look this up at plant level and see if you can find it out it's not that easy yeah but they may bloom anyway without that rest but you may get a better blooming or at least some um, if you get that right and others have a rest period after blooming so they do everything they grow their bulbs push their bulbs up mature their bulbs get their buds out and bloom then they have a rest prior to the new growth period starting yeah but you've got to you know this is down at plant level I'm afraid you can't generalize most cattleya hybrids are gonna be fine being treated the same year in year out they'll be fine <laughs> so it's not something to you know panic over or sweat over or lose sleep over <clears throat> but if you can find out if you've got a cattleya species that you have an inkling might have a resting period if you let me know I will look up to see if it's in the book I bought which is the book I read while I was staying at Rachel's very good book but it hasn't got them all in it's called the classic cattleyas yeah so it hasn't got every species in there it's got those that have been grown over a long period of time and are popular but if it's in there I can look it up and that's where I first came across this concept of some cattleyas having a rest after blooming some cattleyas having a rest after the sheath has formed and the buds won't come unless they get that rest period.
Yeah, the sheath will just stay blind and it will come back into active growth again. The idea is to fool it into thinking, if I don't get some blooms out, nothing's going to happen with this plant. Yeah, so that's your resting. Um, and that's about it really uh, with Cattleyas. Quite honestly, these are pretty easy to grow. They're not that fussy, not really. Right light, yeah, right temperatures, wet dry cycle, some air around the roots. And they should do okay. Soggy roots and excluding air from the media, long term is probably going to take them down. They might put up with it for a while, but there'll come a time when you know the older roots will go faster in that environment than they would have done otherwise and then it's a matter of it hasn't got as many roots as it used to have so it's not feeding and getting nutrients as well as it ought to be its growth will slow down yeah it might only produce a couple of new bulbs instead of four or five yeah and then those will produce roots but that's less roots than it ought to have done for the size of the plant you see what i mean it will gradually go down sometimes they can suddenly go down so anyway that's that's really it we've done light we've done temperatures we've done um repotting we've done watering and feeding I, you know i'm sitting i'm standing here thinking i've really forgotten something <laughs> i can't think what the hell it is Ugh. anyway that's it um I was going to see if I can find, I mean, this one here, this little one here, if I wanted to repot that, now would be a good time. Its latest growth, which has a sheath and signs of buds at the bottom, is pushing new roots now. You could let them get a little bit longer than that, but personally, I, I would do that now. So that one's ready, um, yeah? Um, there are others that as far as the roots are concerned, they're dormant at the moment. My Lalia, my Anceps, which is pushing up two nice spikes at the moment, that's already done its roots for the year. It's not going to grow any more now until it starts thinking about new, new growths. Maybe just prior, maybe just after, but it'll probably finish blooming before it attempts to do anything along the new growths front. And at that point, somewhere around that time, the new roots will come. Yeah, so to repot that now would be a daft idea. It's got no signs of any new roots. They're right down in the pot, coming out the side and round the bottom of the tray. They're not new roots anymore. They're mature roots. And boy, can they snap easily. <laughs> uh, there's another one up here. Yeah. That one has been left a little bit late. If you follow these new roots down in a straight line, they're coming out the side of the pot now. It's still got a couple of new ones starting, but that one's a bit late down the line. That should, you know, if I was going to repot that, which I'm not, um, you know, it would have been better to have done it when these two longer roots were still up here and these were shorter and maybe this one hadn't even started. But to repot that one, it's missed its chance. You could still take a risk. There's still some other new roots showing in places, but... Um, that should have been done a while ago, if it was going to be done at all. So another one over here is chucking out a shed load of new roots at the moment. Yeah, That one would take a repot now. Even though some of those new roots are getting long, it's still got plenty of shorter ones. But that's only up this end of the plant. Goodness knows what's going, up the other end. going on at the other end, because that's growing in several directions. I can't get at that. Yeah, so... I think probably the most important thing with Cattleyas is getting that repotting timing right. And also into a suitable root environment for the plant. Yeah? Most of them have got thick, fleshy, chunky roots. That's the telltale giveaway. Big, thick, fleshy roots tend to like air around them, like the Phalaenopsis do. The more finer the roots, the more likely you'll find them growing in amongst other plants and mosses and the roots of the ferns and things like the oncidiums. You don't very often find oncidiums growing on a bare branch, but you will find cattleyas growing on a bare branch. Yeah, so uh, that's that's it really. Cattleya care. Um, they might sound exotic and tropical and weird and oh, far too difficult for me. Quite honestly, providing you can get that good light without burning the leaves, personally, I think these are easier than Phalaenopsis. 
I've lost more Phalaenopsis than I've ever lost cat ears. And the cat ears I lost in the old days were mainly through Fusarium that I had never even heard of at that time. But these are prone to Fusarium, yeah, rhizomes, pseudobulbs around the base of the plant, they can get it, yeah. Um, probably not quite as prone as the Oncidium Alliance, but not far off. So watch that, watch for lo lost vigour, roots starting to grow and failing. Not because you've got dodgy media, everything seems fine, but the roots just seem to stop growing and won't, won't keep their growing tips going, those are the signs. Also, Cattleyas are scale magnets, oh they love them. <laughs> so watch out for bugs, yeah. especially scale, they absolutely love Cattleya, they seem to come, they arrive by the coach load, where the hell they come from and how they get in I don't know, but they'll have your flipping Cattleyas. Um, scale also like on the Oncidium Alliance. Um, don't get mealy bugs much on the Cattleyas, it's mainly scale. And the youngsters, which look a bit white and fluffy, they pretend to be mealy bugs, but they're not really. They're the crawler stage of the scale. So that's about it. Um, if you suspect a plant's got Fusarium, get on and treat it. Systemic fungicide, get it in there. Soak the pot, soak the roots, soak the whole plant, and then repeat as required on the instructions, whatever it says on the tin. As far as bugs are concerned, well, everybody has their own way of dealing with them, but um, get on and do it. They will ruin the look of your leaves. You'll get little spots all over your leaves where the bite marks are, and they'll often get an infection then, and they'll turn black and look horrible. So um, keep your eye on your bugs. Um, and that's about it, really. Um, I, I, in, in my grow room, Cattleyas are far easier to accommodate and grow well than Phalaenopsis are, but that's because these are a bit more tolerant of the lower temperatures in the winter. They just stop growing. They just think, right, blow, it's too cold. I'm not going to grow. I'll wait for a bit. Whereas the Phalaenopsis, it does have an adverse effect on them getting too cold. Oncidiums are fine with my temperature range. Again, they just slow up when it cools down a bit. So uh, anyway, that's it. I'll add that one into the... Uh, Catlia series and um, the next one in the Catlia series will me having a, be me having a go at the uh, at the Lalia Broughtonia cross to see if we can uh, get at one of those new growths at the base of one of those new growths and see what's going on and that can then decide if it's worth repotting now because the new roots are on their way or is it worth just waiting this 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 might not even produce its new roots till the bulbs are mature so it would be a daft idea repotting it and badly disturbing those roots now because there aren't going to be any new ones for ages so i've got to get that timing right don't want to lose that one that's special okay see you next time thanks for dropping by